Thank you, Brother Richard, for sitting down once again with the Collective Nine for Behind the Final Call cover story. Of course, we are on um, volume number 38, number 23. March 12th is the date on the paper. The title of the paper, Racist Liars, Con Man. Why that cover? Thank you for having me again. Well, racist, liar, con man. This was Michael Cohen's description of President Donald Trump during a recent congressional hearing. Actually, he was in several hearings. Um, one was public, the others were private. This was probably some of the most explosive and explicit condemnations of a president by someone who was close to them that we've probably ever seen in, in this country's history. Um, I would say it rivals that of the disclosures around President Nixon, who eventually resigned as part of the Watergate scandal. But here you have Michael Cohen, who was Mr. Trump's personal lawyer and fixer for 10 years. So he is a man that knew and set up uh, arrangements for things to go away, like payments to women that were involved with the president. This is a man who threatened institutions, colleges, high school and other institutions not to release the president's grades. This is a man who testified Same. that in 10 years, he literally made maybe 500 threats to folks on behalf of Mr. Trump. So we wanted to, to deal with his testimony and delve into what does it mean for the country, again, what does it mean for black people. So this situation that we're seeing in a sense, it's bigger than Donald Trump because the question becomes, what does this mean for a nation? What does it mean for all of these institutions, these American institutions, the presidency, the intelligence agencies, the Congress, as this entire thing starts to unravel and the truth starts to come out, and Mr. Trump in some ways almost looks like a caricature of what an American president but that's because we're used to very smooth, polished, if you will, at least people who can follow a script, even if they're not the brightest crayons in the box. They can read a script. They can follow a script. Well, Mr. Trump is, is totally outside of that box. So we will see. Now, I, I believe, though, despite all of this, his approval ratings, as of maybe a few days ago, had actually gone up. The other thing that I found interesting was, of course, Mr. Mr. Cohen has been found guilty of lying to the, to, to the feds. He is now going to jail for that. He is cooperating with the Mueller uh, investigation and with other investigations into potential wrongdoing uh, by the Trump administration, by the president, and the Trump organization. So now, as a result, to bring it up to date, as a result of this testimony, now 80 different, um, 80 different requests or requests have gone out to 80 different people or, or, or entities connected with the president. Eight requesting information, that, if, that request has come out from Congress. So we say keep watching um, and don't fall asleep. See what is happening with this government. Don't get caught so much in the drama, but try to look beyond the drama and ask yourself what is happening to American society, to American politics, both domestically and internationally. And can America survive this? Will she survive this? And can she come back from it? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, in that same line, well, not necessarily the same line, but still on the line, of what's going on in politics. Um, and of course, the discussion of reparations, that topic is something that's come up again. Um, and of course, um, the favorite for, for many um, in the past, um, in terms of the liberal, was, was Bernie Sanders. And so that, that issue came up with him, as well as our sister um, Kamala Harris. Can you tell us what's going on with that? Well, it, it's interesting to me that reparations has now become an issue. And it's interesting that 
you actually have Democrats that are kind of tap dancing around it and in some ways saying they're for it. Now remember, former President Obama was very clear, I'm not for reparations. That was his position. But you have Kamala Harris, you have uh, Cory Booker, the other black uh, candidate for president. Um, you have Mr. Sanders. And you have others that are now engaged in this discussion about reparations. The question that is generally put to them is whether they are in favor of cash payments to black folks um, as a result of slavery and the aftermath of, look, government enforced policy, government regulation government endorsed and government enshrined uh, second class citizenship from the inception of this country but then these mechanisms kick in and blacks are denied for example as the country expanded westward land was given to whites then they were given uh, agencies were created to help them learn how to farm Agents, agencies were created to help give them technical assistance to be better for them. Then subsidies were added so that they would have a firm economic base. So when you start to look at this issue and when you look at it from the perspective of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I think that he gave us the best yardstick because he said if you look really remorseful, and if you really want to repair the damage, give us some states. Five or six literal states. Well, some people might say, man, well, that's that's not, that's unrealistic. Well, if that's unrealistic, then perhaps it's unrealistic for you to think that those who have oppressed us for four centuries plus now are suddenly going to change. It's interesting to me that this discussion is even being held. Mr. Sanders came out again on the Breakfast Club a couple of days ago saying he was not for reparations and again talking about we need to deal with the disenfranchised and the distressed communities of color, the distressed communities of whites, all of these. But I think we're seeing over and over again this idea of trickle down governmental assistance never seems to reach black people. So this refusal to target black folks, can you talk about reparations without talking about race? Doesn't seem to make sense. So we examined that in this article. Uh, I think it's a very good piece. I invite you to go to finalcall.com and subscribe to the digital edition or and get your print edition. I mean, I think we got a very beautiful paper, uh, the way it's laid out. And get some good information and go to finalcall.com. You can search for reparations. We got tons of articles on this subject and, and a few great articles from the minister specifically on reparations that will give you a baseline to begin discussing this issue in an intelligent way. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Brother Richard. Um, still staying on politics for a little bit longer. Of course, recently the election um, um, for mayor occurred in Chicago. Yes. And there's now going to be a runoff, interestingly, between two black women. Yeah. Um, some said that wasn't shocking to, to them. It was shocking to me. And, of course, one of these women is known to be um, a lesbian. Yeah. So, can you, what, what you got for us? Um, we will see um, over the next couple of months. Uh, who will be the mayor of Chicago? I think sexual orientation aside, um, the question is what are either candidates, what is either candidate going to deliver to black people? I came across a piece in the Chicago Crusader, a black women's newspaper, that said Lori Lightfoot, who was one of the who was one of the women, didn't win any black people. Now remember, we had a we had a ton of people. We, we had I don't know over what five, six, seven, eight, nine different people running. So will she be able to appeal to black folks? How will she appeal to black folks? Tony Preckwinkle is.
Cook County board chair, pretty powerful political figure in the county and in the city. She was in the city council. Uh, so there's now a runoff between these two women. Um, the other thing was the turnout in the election was low. So those areas that did turn out had a disproportionate impact, if you will, on the election because so many people didn't vote. So I'll give you an example. For example, uh, Willie Wilson, businessman, uh, ran for mayor for a second time. He actually, uh, a few years ago, pushed very hard in his campaign. He won some black votes. He was a favorite in many black wards, but he did not get enough votes for a citywide election. And with the number of different candidates, the vote was split. So even um, Bill Daly, that name sounds familiar to anyone familiar with Chicago politics, the brother of the former mayor, Richard M., son of the uh, former old man, Daly, Richard J., ran. Interestingly enough, in his home political ward for that family, a young white guy won. There was tremendous turnout in that ward. But the young white guy was sucking up all the votes from that war that denied uh, Bill Daly the opportunity to get into a runoff. Because in Chicago, you have to have 50% plus one in order to declare the winner out. If not now, you get what we have now, which is a runoff between two candidates. So it should be a pretty interesting race. Lori Lightfoot. Uh, was over the agencies that they're supposed to um, kind of monitor police and ensure police accountability. So I think we need to stay tuned. Um, and black folks need to get into what, when it comes to violence, when it comes to, again, I mean, the basic issues that we seem to deal with over violence, education, economic development, and community development what's going to happen. So we now have an opportunity to see some change. So the other thing for me is, you know, black folks always have a certain value when votes are made. The question is, will they have the same value when votes are cast? Or will any type of black agenda, any type of black uh, interest be subsumed by the interests of other groups? So we need to, again, stay attention, stay tuned, um, and uh, we'll see where this thing ends up. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. want to stay on, the, on, on politics, but let's move a little bit to international politics um, and what's going on with that. We mentioned, um, um, I believe, last week um, how they have tried to bring the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan into the affairs of Israel. Um, so there's an article on page 12, Israel Attorney General Recommends Charges Against Netanyahu. So Benjamin Netanyahu was the Prime Minister for Israel. Pretty, pretty what right wing, uh, hawkish guy. Um, so recommendation has been that Mr. Netanyahu be indicted in three separate cases for accepting gifts, trading influence, um, and being engaged in these different corrupt practices. Actually, he and his wife have been accused of something. Very interesting race, and it, it is so tight. And this is interesting. And one, of the, one of the interesting things about this. Mr. Netanyahu, in order to try to win, uh, because he's going to be, his election, or the election for prime minister, will be April 9th. So, of course, in the midst of all of this corruption charges, in the midst of all of this controversy, he has to try to forge some kind of coalition among parties so that he can, he can retain power. So what he did, he reached out to a couple of quote-unquote extremists, Jewish Zionist parties, parties that one in particular is out of the kind of spiritual, political, social ideology of the late Rabbi Michael Haney, who was an extremist and a terrorist, one of his followers walked into a Muslim prayer of 
place of prayer in Hebron and killed over 20 people. Just came in with an automatic weapon because he was also an Israeli defense force soldier. It shot his people to death. He's also been beaten to death by the survivors. And if you go to finalguard.com and read my editorial from last editorial from last week, you can read about that. So there's a lot going on with these politics. Um, and so the question becomes as this kind of controversy raised rages. This is a man who has close connections to the president, Benjamin Netanyahu. This is a man who, for all intents and purposes, remains a favorite of the Jewish community. This is a man who has close ties to uh, Jared Kushner, the president. So we need to watch this. We need to see what's happening now. That's in Israeli politics. But domestically, the uh, U.S. representative recently elected a Muslim sister out of Minnesota has been accused now of anti-Semitism because she has been critical of Israel. So all of these things are bringing us back again to questions about power, influence, policy. How that's going to impact the Middle East. How is that going to impact America? How much money is going to be spent? Um, and whether in particular in the American context, can you even criticize American policy toward Israel? So this is a very um, serious subject. And again, we say, you know, watch the March Madness is coming. You can get a little bit of that if you want. Um, enjoy whatever little diversionary program that you may enjoy. Listen to some music, you know, like this little old Cardi B, if you will, but don't sleep on her politics. Don't sleep on her politics, because she didn't make a couple uh, very interesting statements recently about the country and some of the things that it's facing. But never should our entertainment overshadow our education. And we should constantly be in the mode of learning and understanding what's going on around us and being involved in impact what's going on around us. So hopefully... What we offer you in the final call helps you to be engaged and involved. Yes, sir. So I'm staying with the, the same um, spirit for a little bit with international news and what's going on. And of course, this is a period of time in which, unfortunately and fortunately, um, unfortunately that it's taken a long time for us to pay the attention to not only black women in the United States, but women in general. Uh, and so the issue in the UN has come up being accused of failing to move aggressively against sexual abuse. This is a long standing problem with the United We've seen it in Africa, we've seen it in Haiti, um, we've seen it in almost any theater where you and peace kids have gone. And the problem becomes over and over again two levels. One, sexism and sexual uh, harassment inside the United Nations as an entity. And then you have the sexual um, exploitation of women and children at the lowest level uh, being those who are in dire straits that the UN is supposed to be Peacekeepers are supposed to be protected, and we see over and over again that they have failed, and they have failed, you know, miserably to really deal with this issue. So uh, now you're talking about thousands. You and the UN has thousands of you know, employees, but it has really yet to deal with this problem of sexual exploitation and sexual harassment. So, um, but again, you know, this is um, kind of indicative of what we see in American society and in societies around the world where there's a real lack of respect for women and a value of women. So you can read this piece and again, uh, stay in touch and stay informed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope I'm going to go one more time to international news.
Um, I know you shared with me before that you have a special affinity towards um, Haiti. And of course, there's some things that are going on there. Um, article on page 24 of the newspaper, Standing with the People's Uprising in Haiti. You know, Haiti is the first black republic in Western uh, our brothers and sisters in Haiti <laughs> overthrew the French and took their freedom. They weren't granted their freedom. They defeated Napoleon's army, which was the greatest army at the time. This is the inception of the Haitian Republic. And in the original Haitian Constitution, not only did they outlaw slavery, but if you were black and you got to Haiti, you would be free. Now, Sadly, and I'm going back historically because I want to kind of start again going forward. America blockaded. <laughs> America blockaded Haiti after she took her freedom from the French. So the combination of these Western powers squeezing this Black Republic, you know, that the Haitians were forced to play, forced to play right billions to the French in reparations for taking their freedom from people that have enslaved them. So there's a long history of Western intervention in the country and now once again we are seeing it rise up because of the levels of, of poverty because of different aspects of Haitian politics where the U.S. was directly involved including uh, years ago uh, John Bertrand Aristide was a popular political figure and priest who became president. He was ousted in a coup. He was eventually brought back, but there was no continuity. There was no extended time for the time that he lost in other countries. And so we see this convulsion in Asian politics over and over again. So now we have some battles with police, some battles on the streets. But, and this is the piece we're working on for this week, there were about six white men in Haiti. Now you know Haiti's a black country. Arms with high powered weapons, um, multiple license plates, and other kind of clandestine weapons or tools that you would think would be connected to clandestine activity. What were they doing? Who were they protecting? They insisted that they were there to protect some Haitian politicians. But they, once they were caught, they were whisked out of the country. You never heard, I mean, it kind of came up and went down, that was that. So we're working specifically on that story for next week. Because as the minister has taught us to understand, where is the hidden thing? What is it doing? What is, it, what is its motivation? And how do we counter it? It's a uh, nefarious activity. So stay tuned to Haiti. We will try to uh, continue to bring you good quality information. Yes, I, I know I'm jumping around. And it's too, um, well, actually, I think I would just close out on this one and, and, and give you the floor. Um, but there's an article on page 11. And of course, as we look at what's going on abroad, we always have to definitely be interested and concerned and pay attention to what's going on right here. And country that we currently reside in. And um, there's an article, Peace in the Hood is Possible. Well, this is, this is a story out of Miami about one of our uh, young up-and-coming writers, Janaya Adams, uh, great young sister. So she writes about different groups in Miami that are all working on helping to resolve problems. Um, whether it's violence, whether it's uh, arts and culture, whether it's, it's, it's uh, immigration, or other policy and social issues. So we wanted to show, we wanted to highlight people doing good things. We have to always look to ourselves for solutions, and we always like to tell the story of those who are working to, as the Honorable Black Mama said, unite and do something for so you can check that story out. It's a, it's a very good piece. Uh, not too long. But learn a little bit about what's happening and good and how 
people are involved in this struggle uh, to save our, our communities. And again, uh, Sister Janai is a great young writer, and uh, we want you to support her and her stuff. And I know I didn't intend on going here, but you know, I always like to end on a positive note. Um, and of course, there's a, a beautiful article about student minister William Muhammad being honored in Milwaukee. Um, can you give us a little bit about what that's about and the work that he is being honored? Well, this, this was um, Brother William has been honored for his 60th birthday. He's worked for many years now in Milwaukee. Um, he's actually worked for 26 years in the ministry. So the evening was a kind of recognition of his leadership benefit, in addition to not only 26 years in uh, the ministry, but almost 30 years of service in the nation of Islam. Uh, the former capital of the field right here in Chicago. So we're glad to see him uh, being recognized for his good work. And the people in the community coming out showing again that the nation of Islam is an integral part of black America. We're not some uh, we're not some random, misplaced, out of step, out of touch. We're right there in the heart of the community with our And this is another example of that. So go to finalcall.com or get your copy of the thing. We got beautiful pictures. Um, and read about black people showing appreciation to one another for the work that we do. And hopefully it will inspire us to keep going and maybe inspire us to do a little more. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, I, I just, it's really important that people know that there's not necessarily always a rhyme and reason and we don't sit down before the show and decide which articles we're going to go on, go into and that it's not necessarily set up that these are the important articles and the other ones aren't that. But I, it, it, it's kind of random. I, I'm going through the paper. It's really fresh. He doesn't know which articles we're going to go through. And guess what? I don't know which articles I'm going to go through until we get to them. But um, just want to give you an opportunity before we close out. Is there any ones that we got to touch on before we go out? But we always want to let you know that everything is not covered in the show. We don't even try to cover everything in the show. But we just want to give you a taste of it. And we really encourage you to get a subscription to the digital edition. For those who carry a, a phone with them or carry a tablet with them, you want to always have the paper with you. You can actually have the paper ran to you if you like. Yep. You know, there's yep. those features there, but get a subscription. It don't have to be a digital one. You may not be into that. Get a subscription to support the Final Call newspaper. Well, first of all, you got to read the Memphis article. It's been how to protect the uh, I think in, in, even though it, it's a reprint, but I think the principles and the lessons that he imparts are very important, in particular at this time, when the foundations of democracy have been shaken in this country. So you got to read it. Relatively short article. You have to read the Uncle Mama's article this week. Beware of false promises. I'm not even going to get into that, but check that out for yourself. Always on time. And we got an editorial this week. No justice for Terrence Stefan, a black American. And we're dealing with uh, recent decisions where some of Stefan Clark, his brother, shot in his grandmother's backyard. The decision was made that the cops and law that was unarmed would not be charged. Then there was the federal look into the killing of Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is at the federal level. Stephon Clark was at the state level. At the federal level, they were looking into it again. Another unarmed black man shot to death by a white female police officer who's now, I believe, gone on to work for somebody else. <laughs> Feds, we couldn't find any. We couldn't find any reason to to prosecute. You see this over and over again. So check out that editorial, uh, and uh, hopefully gives you something to consider. Uh, and we think it's just an important thing that we try to bring to you good news, analysis, and perspective. So. 
This is our 40th year anniversary. We want you to stay tuned, stay with us. We hope to have some great things happening and announce soon. Can't hear me like a bad website and some other stuff. But just stay tuned. And, uh, we also have to go on our social media. We have a special week. We're doing reprints of, of different Kate Moody's paintings. And we just did a special reprint of. The second edition of the final call ever published. It is available for free now. Because we want you to, to learn something about the conspiracy that was involved in the construction of the nation. And we can get the words out of this. The rope is whole, basically, of this whole edition almost himself. And he lays out those that were allied against the other black people in the wild. So go to our social media, go to uh, Adam's Bar, Adam Twitter, and download his uh, PDF or reach out to us at Final Call, uh, door.finalcall.com, call us at the Final Call Administration building, and you can get a printed copy as well. Very important story. I mean, very important addition of the paper. Very timely, and we have to always. Study, stop, or look, and learn so we stay on top of where we need to be. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'll take this opportunity once again for those who don't have this beautiful, beautiful book um, Dope Busters, the true story of the DC crack cocaine crisis and successful Muslim anti drug patrols. You, you, you want to get it. You want to get it. You want to get it. You definitely want to get it. Um, can you give us a, a quick snap shot of where you can get the book from? Well, I'm the author of the book. It's my first book. Um, you can get it right now. You can contact me um, either uh, through social media, Richard Muhammad, or Facebook. Um, you can order it right now. The book is $28. shipping and handling. And you can order it at uh, through the uh, Cash App, uh, dollar sign RM Final Call, or through PayPal, um, straight words four at gmail.com, or simply go to richardmohammed.com, richardmohammed.com, and you can see how to order. You can place your order, or you can contact me if you have questions. But, you know, I was just actually looking through this today. It's got some good information. Um, in terms of the whole crack cocaine crisis, the policy, what it was about, what it wasn't about. Like the basic question, these policies that weren't acting as a result of the crack cocaine epidemic that impacted black folks, could their impact be foreseen? Did nobody have a clue? Was it really about policy or was it about politics? So we answer some of these questions in this book. We also talk about the tremendous level of love and faith that it took for the brothers who went into an arm, open their drug market with nothing but their faith. We don't carry weapons. And uh, check out the book. But let's just say, I don't want to give you the whole story, but let's just say a sawed off shotgun was involved. Not carried by us, but carried somebody else. And in the end, service of a lawsuit. And the one with the shotgun lived to talk about. Got to tapped up a little bit. He lived. So that's a miracle in and of itself. Because he would have done it to police, he would have been blown to bits. But anyway, a real true story. I mean, this is a true story. It's true history. You can't afford to lose it. You can't afford to miss it. Um, and there's a whole other side to this. This is really this book really just scratches the surface, um, but it tells some of the story of the brothers involved, why we, I was actually one of them, why we did one of them, what it was like at that time. And we kind of close with not only why it was important yesterday, but why is it important today. So, richardmohammed.com or find me on richardmohammed on Twitter. Or uh, Facebook, again, Cash App, Dollar Sign, RM Final Call, or PayPal, uh, Straight Words for Gmail. You'll like it.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, of course, we, we had discussions, so be on the lookout. You want to make sure that you subscribe to all the social media platforms for Final Call, as well as Richard Muhammad. Um, and, and you can tell typically if it's Richard's uh, brother Richard's um, Facebook page, because you're going to see the cover of the latest edition of the Final Call. That's right. Paper today. And you'll see the cover of the book right now. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. But make sure you subscribe to all those platforms, as well as please support and subscribe to the Collective Nine across social media platforms. But be on the lookout. We, 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 we really going to celebrate this 40th anniversary of the Final Call newspaper, and there'll be plenty of articles and plenty of information that you won't be able to get unless you're following us. So make sure you keep it up to date with what's going on with us. Until next time, behind the Final Call and Peace. Peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.